Hi, everyone. I'm Beth Pike with the State Historical Society of Missouri, and we are pleased to bring back Greg Olson, who did a wonderful presentation at our headquarters in Columbia earlier this year. We had many requests from the public who didn't catch Greg's talk, so he kindly agreed to do a Zoom with all of you. So thank you for joining us. Greg yeah, Olson has written multiple books and articles mm -hmm. on the history of the Iowa and Missouri Indians and the indigenous people along the lower Missouri River Valley. In 2020, Olson was a Center for Missouri Studies fellow examining the treaties that gave the United States legal claim to the state of Missouri. His recent book, Indigenous Missourians, Ancient Societies to the Present, is available online at shop.shsmo.org, or you can visit our bookstore inside the Center for Missouri Studies in Columbia. We also have exciting recent news to share about Greg's book. He received the 2024 Book Award at the Missouri Conference on History held just last month. So now let's hear from author and historian Greg Olson, who will discuss the resiliency and in indigenous Missourians who have lived here for thousands of years and continue to call Missouri home today. Welcome, Greg. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Beth, for the introduction. Thanks everybody for checking in with us. It's uh, a pleasure to give this talk again. And I wanna thank the Beth and the State Historical Society of Missouri for all of the, um, the help and the support they've given me in this project and the support they gave me when this uh, book was coming together. Um, just a couple of things that I, I uh, need to point out before we get going too far here. And that is, first of all, I am not an indigenous person. Um, but as a white historian, uh, it seems like I am part of a uh, demographic and a career that has done a lot of done a lot of harm, I think, to uh, the story of indigenous people over the years, so, um, in the last couple of hundred years. And and uh, one of the things I talk about in this book is how we've written indigenous people out of the history of Missouri. So that's one of the reasons that even though I'm not indigenous, I feel it's important to for me to try and, and tell this story as best I can. And um, <clears throat> As is traditional when talking about Indigenous people, uh, I need to ask for your forgiveness beforehand for anything that I might say that might lead you to misunderstand or that might misrepresent Indigenous people. And with that, um, I like this slide. I do not generally do land acknowledgments in my talks, and uh, and the reason is is that I think they are... Um, problematic, to say the least. I think really um, it's one thing to acknowledge the people who whose land this is, and later in my talk I will talk about who who has lived in Missouri before us. But I think for uh, land acknowledgments to really have any kind of meaning, it's uh, they really need to include some sort of a, a commitment or a pledge to commit to work with people who who uh, for the, for whom this is their homeland and help them uh, you know interact with this land in a meaningful way and I will have one example a successful example um, of that that's happened in Kansas and is actually still kind of going on. So the first question that people always want to know um, is who lived in Missouri? Which tribes lived in Missouri? And that's actually one of the things that got me interested in this uh, this particular book project to begin with, because um, people would ask me and I didn't always have a good answer for them. So uh, one of the things that I'll be talking about is the fact that people have lived here over 12,000 years in the land that we now call Missouri. Um, and I think actually we are going to find out that people have lived here for far longer than 12,000 years. Indigenous people will mostly say that their creation stories begin here uh, in North America, what we call Turtle Island. <clears throat> and so they don't really see themselves as, as immigrants coming from Asia, um, as, as we have been taught over the years. But um, so it's we'll never know who the people were who lived here for all those thousands of years. People were always coming, always going. And and so we, we don't really know the names of those people. The best we can do 
is to uh, be able to place people at the time of first contact. And in Missouri, we call first contact with Europeans. We date that at 1673. Uh, the reason that is, is that was when Marquette and Joliet um, came to this part of the world. And actually, they really just uh, sailed down the uh, Mississippi River. And they had planned to go all the way, I think, to the Gulf of Mexico, but they got down into uh, Arkansas and the Quapaws to uh, convince them to turn around and told them if they went any farther, they, they might end up in trouble. But uh, in Missouri, they landed in a, a village called Peoria, which belonged to the Peoria people of the Illinois Confederacy. And, and uh, that was way up in extreme north East Missouri, almost up by the Des Moines River there. And so from them, from the Peorias, they got a, a, a little bit of a story about who lived here, even though Narquette and Joliet didn't really go inland at all. And so this is kind of the lay of the land um, as, it, as it existed when Marquette and Joliet here, were here. There were, at the time, really three big, powerful groups of indigenous people living in Missouri. Um, we'll start on the east side of the state and then we kind of work our way west. But the Illinois Confederacy was a group of uh, probably as many as 17 different um group uh, tribes i don't know that they were if they were uh, different tribes or if they were 17 different clans or different groupings of the same people they all spoke the same language and they were at the time 1673 they were very um very strong and very powerful and uh, anybody indigenous people who wanted to trade on the mississippi river they had to deal with the illinois confederacy uh tribes that involved that were involved in that that are still around today of course were the peoria there was a tribe called the cahokias uh the kaskaskias um i think the miami were a part of that many many groups and many of whom are still around today um, down here in the boot heel, you'll see the Chickasaws and the Quapaws listed, and mostly they were not uh, residents of Missouri, but uh, definitely the Chickasaws lived on the east side of the Mississippi River, but would come over for hunting um, and things like that. The Quapaws lived mostly down in Arkansas. Uh, along the Arkansas River, but and along the St. Francis River, but they would come up into Missouri uh, to hunt things like that. Then as we move west, we see right in the middle of the state, the Little Osages, and then below them, the Great Osages. And they were really the same people. Um, the fact that we call some people Little Osages and some Great Osages really has to do with a, a, a mistranslation. Um, the Little Osages were just an, a different group, a different uh, clan of the Osage tribe. They tended to live separately from the rest of the tribe. And a, tr a mistranslation by the French uh, ended up ha uh, having them called Little Osages. So, of course, the other ones uh, by default became the Great Osages. They were, of course, uh, that's the best known um, nation that lived in Missouri, and they controlled land from the Mississippi River, I'm sorry, the Missouri River, all the way south into what is now Kansas and Oklahoma and Arkansas. Uh, they were very, very strong. They were good at fighting, they were good at hunting, good business people, and a lot of a lot of folks will tell you that had it not been for the Osages and their ability to hunt and trap and make a business out of that and work with early French traders like the Chateaus, uh, the city of St. Louis would have never existed, at least not in the uh, not as successfully as it turned out to be. Some people consider the Osages founders, co-founders of St. Louis, because the, it was their economic influence that allowed that town to prosper. North of them, then we have the Missourias. Um, the Missourias, probably some of you have heard of Van Meter State Park. And there is a site of a Missouri village on the park, just on the east side of the park up on the bluffs. Um, they were another very strong 
nation, they controlled most of the trade on the Missouri River. So if you wanted to trade, you had to deal with them. They were also very uh, strong fighters. Fortunately, the Little Osages and the Missourias, because they lived near each other, were pretty much allies, got together, got along pretty well, um, and, and uh, had villages very, very close to each other. Then way up in the north part of the state, we had the Iowas and the Odos, and they were relatives of the Missourias. They all three uh, speak the Chuere language, uh, a Siouan language, and at one time were all one people, but had kind of spread out by the time Marquette and Joliet got here. Now, I talk about how things change quite a bit, and this next map is from 1803, and that's the time of the Louisiana Purchase. And you can see things have changed. That was 150 years. But uh, I think between the, uh, the influence of white people moving in during that 150 years um, and the pressure that white people put on tribes living further east really changed, changed the, the makeup of who lived in Missouri. So you'll see on the eastern part of the state, we no longer really see the... Um, Illinois Confederacy, they had been defeated um, in a series of wars and battles, uh, mostly by the Iroquois. And of course, when you think of Iroquois, you think of, you know, the Eastern Great Lakes, but because of pressure from white people, there were a lot of Iroquois who came west. And of course, at some point they collided and, and, and had confrontations with the Illinois Confederacy. So they were kind of broken up, definitely became far less powerful, and that left room for the Sacs and Foxes to move down into northeastern Missouri. The Sac and Fox were from uh, really Wisconsin to begin with, and uh, they moved down into, they lived in in Iowa, and, and the, the uh, disappearance or the disbandment of a lot of the Illinois Confederacy left room for them to move down. Um, we'll just go straight west from them. You'll see the Iowas. Um, the Missourias, as strong as they were, were defeated in a series of uh, wars with the Sac and Fox. And in the by the uh, 1790s, were almost annihilated in, in a series of battles. <clears throat> so the Missourias and the Odos moved up into what is now Nebraska. Um, they kind of got together. Uh, because the two tribes had both taken it pretty hard and because they were relatives, they banded together and lived in Nebraska. And today they're still known as the Oto Missouri nation. Uh, of course, the Osages are still a lot around. The little Osages had moved south down to the uh, Osage River. You see them, uh, a group of great Osages by the Osage River. And then also there are great Osages living down in Arkansas and uh, where Arkansas and Oklahoma meet. Pardon me. We have um, uh, the Quapaws still living around the Boot Hill, but there are three new tribes that are sh that show up in uh, southern Missouri, and those are the Kickapoos, the Shawnees, and the Delawares. And and the, uh, when Spain, it, of course, you know your Missouri history, so France owned. Um, this part of the world up until the 1760s and then they sold it to Spain and when Spain um, took over they really didn't have enough people to populate their new colony let alone administrate it and they invited different groups of people to come move into Missouri and they uh, moved they invited the Shawnees and the Delawares two tribes that were from around Indiana, I guess, what's now Indiana. And they gave them land around Cape Girardeau. And then the Kickapoos, uh, also from Illinois mostly, uh, there were a group of Kickapoos who settled around what is now Springfield, Missouri. And they did that in order to, you know, be left alone. They wanted to be left alone from white people and to live the lives they wanted to live. Um, and what also happened is that because the Kickapoos kind of moved into Osage land, there got to be quite a bit of, uh, of trouble between Kickapoos and Osages. All right. And this is a map I put together. So you, that shows you where all of these tribes um, are, are today. 
So Missouri has kind of a unique history with in, with uh, indigenous people in that we um, forced all indigenous people out of the state in the 1830s. You've heard of the Cherokee Trail of Tears and the Potawatomi Trail of Death, uh, forced removals, you know, that crossed Missouri of, of indigenous people. But um, uh, that the same thing happened with other tribes, and 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 it, by 1837, I guess Missouri had forced all the tribes that I showed you on the previous two maps out of the state, and so this just gives you an idea of where they ended up: Sac and Fox, Kickapoo's, Iowa's. Uh, a few of them ended up uh, in in uh, Kansas, and these are the reservations that still exist there today, but most of them ended up down in Oklahoma. So uh, Missouri, that's kind of Missouri's legacy, uh, is that we are a state that has no um, current settlement or reservation for an Indian nation. Um, and we, I think we in Arkansas maybe are the only states east of the, west of the Missouri River, rather, that have that have that situation. And so because of that, I think we have sort of been taught that in, uh, that Missouri has no indigenous people. And, and the myth is, is that, you know, indigenous people don't live here. This is not Indian country. And so this is one of the things that I really wanted to, um, some, I guess, a myth that I wanted to bust in my book here. So myth number one is that there have been no indigenous people in Missouri since the 1830s. Um, on the left side here is uh, a page from Miss the Laws of Missouri, and it's an 1839 act that prohibits, uh, it's the Supre act to suppress intercourse with Indians. And one of the things that it says, I believe in uh, number two, um, of that law, it says that no native pe person will be permitted to come into the state of Missouri uh, without a writ the written permission of a federal Indian agent. Um, and so, you know, unless your Indian agent gave you a pass to come into Missouri, you couldn't. This was not particularly well, um, it, it was a law that was not really enforced very well. But what it did do successfully is that it managed to get all of the larger groups of indigenous people um, out of the state, while uh, thousands of people, of course, individuals stayed behind. And we'll talk about that a little bit here in a minute. Um, the picture in the center of the slide is a picture of Francis White Cloud. Um, he was an Iowa leader and um, he was the father of another Iowa leader. In 1836, Francis White Cloud was still quite a young man, and he was asked to sign a treaty that would give uh, Iowa land, the last Iowa land that they owned in the state of Missouri, to the federal government. And he wasn't sure what to do about that. So there's a, a, there's a folklore story, the legend that he went to the top of King Hill in St. Joseph, southern part of St. Joseph, and he prayed to the creator wanting to know if, if he should sign that treaty and if, if the Iowa should move across the Missouri River into Kansas where they were going to be given a reservation. He didn't know what to do, and you notice in his hand, uh, I guess in his right hand, he's got a lance or a spear, and in his left hand, it's kind of hard to tell what he's got, but it's supposed to be a plant called plantain, and this is not the plantain that uh, is like corn that you eat. Um, it's the kind of plantain uh, that grows all over Missouri. It's a weed, and especially along paths or where the dirt is really hard it will grow. And it was an invasive plant that was brought by the English to the U.S. because it was meant to, uh, it, it was a good medicinal plant, had all kinds of uses. But the natives called it, supposedly called it white man's foot because the story goes is that if you saw that plant growing uh, somewhere, then you knew that white people and their settlement was not far behind. And the story goes when Francis White Clyde was praying up on top of King Hill, he looked and he saw some of that white man's foot, some of that plantain plant. 
And uh, that's when he decided that he would sign the treaty. We call it the Platt Purchase Treaty, which gave the United States the north, what is now the five north, most northwest counties in the state of Missouri. Um, and the Iowa's moved into what is now Kansas and Nebraska. So that was really the last indigenous tribe, the, them and the Sac and Foxes that were forced out of Missouri. By the way, that law uh, re remained on the books until about 1910 when it was sort of it, uh, disappeared from the, the law books. And so because of that history, um, something that happened over, what, 170 years ago, because of that history, I think that we, as I said earlier, uh, believe that there are, have been no indigenous people in Missouri since the 1830s. And so I posted pictures of um, a couple of my friends here, Cody Goff, you'll notice that picture on the left. That's the picture that's on the front of the book, Indigenous Missourians. Um, and uh, Cody is Ho-Chunk, which is uh, Winnebago. They're related to the Winnebagos. And I believe he's originally from uh, Wisconsin or his people are, but he lives in Jamestown, Missouri. One of the nicest people you'll ever meet. And uh, he's a uh, traditional powwow dancer. And um, the picture on the right is our friend Linda Coulter, who sadly passed away last year. And she lived around Kabul, Missouri. She is was of uh, Lakota ancestry. And I think that when we think about, even though we know better, I think subconsciously when we think about Native people living in Missouri, this is what we expect to see, right? We expect to see people who look like maybe the kind of indigenous people we've seen in the old Westerns. When in fact, uh, indigenous people also look like this, and this is Cody and Linda, uh, when they're not dressed out in regalia. Um, I mean, they're, you know, they're, uh, they don't, there's really nothing about them in these pictures that says, you know, I'm native, I'm indigenous. Um, and so I think because we've been taught by by movies and television shows and th that you know we have a certain expectation of what an indigenous person would look like the fact is in indigenous people are ever, everywhere right there are 27,000 people in Missouri who have in the last census um, claimed indigenous heritage okay so they they are everywhere there are neighbors there are friends we just don't see them as indigenous um, and that kind of leads into another myth of uh, myth number two, indigenous culture is a thing of the past. And I think when we, when we see people like Cody and Linda dressed, you know, and like everyone else, then part of us makes the assumption that, well, if they're dressed like that, you know, they must not be real Indians, you know, and I don't know what, what do we expect really Indians to, you know, go to the grocery store in their regalia. I mean, you know, they're just like everybody else. And of course, uh, there was a long history in the United States of trying to assimilate indigenous people. This is a picture, I believe this picture is from the Carlisle uh, boarding school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And it is was the first federal boarding school and sort of the model for all of the boarding schools that would come afterwards. I think this uh, opened up in the years after the Civil War, I believe about the 1870s. Um, and kids were removed from their families. They were moved you know, to a place that was far away from where they grew up. They were made to dress in European style clothing. They, you notice the boys all have short haircuts. Uh, every attempt was made to do everything possible to assimilate Native people into, um, into uh, you know, the, the white European culture. And so I think it, it, uh, because of that, it, it gives us some kind of um, uh, strange ideas. I think the general population has strange ideas about um, the past, indigenous people in the past. And so I sort of made up this facetious timeline um, that, you know, in a lot of our memories, we think of uh, prehistory as a time when, you know, we don't, I don't know, Indians, you know, wore furs and, and hunted mastodons. And then in, 
1492, Columbus came and he discovered the Indians. And then after that, the Indians all died off during the historical period. Uh, I think that in some ways in the popular imagination, we kind of pared Indian history down into to that. When in fact, as I mentioned earlier, indigenous people have been in Missouri for at least 12,000 years. And I think that uh, archaeological evidence is pointing uh, all the time toward uh, uh, a, a much longer history in Missouri. I mean, we now have, uh, you, you may have heard uh, in uh, New Mexico, White Sands, New Mexico, there are human footprints that are 23,000 years old. And in South America, there are different sites that have much are much older than 12,000 years. And I think that we are going to discover here in Missouri as well that people have been here a lot longer than that. So I put together the real timeline and you'll see it starts 2000 years ago and it goes way down to the bottom. And if you look at the very bottom of my timeline, the period of colonization, that's only been about 300 years. So you look at how that small little gray area at the bottom of the timeline and then everything above it, um, European American presence on this continent is really a small part of indigenous history. And so that gets us down to the, uh, the title where I got the title for this presentation, Points, Pots, Pipes, and Powwows. Um, Again, confronting a myth that indigenous culture is a thing of the past, indigenous culture is static. Um, you know, these are people that never made any inventions, never came up with any new ideas. And, and I just wanted to come up with uh, four different examples of, of uh, very innovative ways indigenous people dealt with, uh, dealt with everyday life. And points are the first thing. In the middle there, you'll see a Clovis point on the left and a Dalton point on the right. The Clovis point is the was the very some of the very earliest points in Missouri. Clovis was not necessarily an ethnicity; it was sort of a sort of a culture, Clovis culture. Okay, um, the people who lived during that time probably had all kinds of different backgrounds and came from all different kinds of places. But for a brief period of time, uh, a little over a thousand years, they in, or, or uh, a little less than a thousand years, they adopted Clovis culture, which means, you know, that uh, through trade and, and travel and things, people adopted this ubiquitous point. Um, because of the point, I think it led us to believe that, that you see the picture on the far left, that uh, these were uh, mostly big game hunters. These were people who hunted mammoths, mastodons, saber-toothed tigers, things like that. And while that did happen in Missouri, and in fact, there have been um, uh, bones found with, with Clovis points, you know, embedded in them or uh, animal bear, animals, skeletons found with the, the points nearby. Um, these were more opportunistic people. If they happened to come up with uh, an opportunity to hunt a large megafauna, they would, but they also were hunters and gatherers and, and were pretty much pretty good at exploiting the uh, uh, the environment in which they found themselves living. That was a time when the Ice Age was, the last Ice Age was coming to an end. Uh, it was a time when things were a little cooler, a little moister. You'll see the vegetation is very lush. Um, and 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 so the, the Clovis Point worked pretty well for that time period. It was also, also worked great as a scraper, you know, a uh, something working for working with wood. It was kind of, uh, some people have called it the leather man tool uh, of the of the ancient Missouri. And uh, some people have called it the first great American invention. The Dalton tool comes along afterwards and you see it's a little more refined. It's a little smaller. And the picture on the right, you see conditions have changed as the ice age came to an end. Um, Missouri started to become a little drier. The, the uh, forests receded in some places. There was more grassland. These uh, large mammoths, mastodons, the, the large megafauna disappeared. And so uh, people find themselves slowly having to adapt to hunting in a new environment and a new reality. And so you see the picture 
a couple of interesting differences. Um, this man is hunting a much smaller animal, a deer, but he's also hunter, hunt, uh, hunting it with uh, a spear that's attached to what's called an atlatl. And an atlatl is a little lever that he's holding in his hand. And what he's going to do is he's going to flick his forearm and his wrist forward. And that lever, that spear is going to come out of that lever at a much stronger velocity than he would be able to throw it. So this, uh, that in itself was, it was a pretty amazing innovation in hunting. And then to go along with it was this smaller, sharper uh, point that works better for small game than for the large megafauna. Number two is pots. Uh, again, I think the just the invention of pottery is an amazing thing it is in and of itself. Um, it definitely had some pluses and it had some minuses. Before pottery, people would carry water in um, tightly woven baskets. But pottery uh, was kind of an amazing thing because it would hold water for a long period of time. Um, you could use it for cooking. You could use it for all kinds of things. Unfortunately, uh, it was also very fragile and you really couldn't travel with pottery very well because it was easy to break. And so on the left side, you see uh, a portion of a pot from about 2,600 year, 2, years ago. And you notice that it's, uh, it's very crude, very rustic. The quality of the clay is rough. It's got a lot of temper, hard grit temper in it to keep it together. And also you notice that the decoration is pretty simple. And then on the right, um, 2000 years later, you see a much different, more refined kind of pottery. Pottery has gone into now not only being utilitarian, but it's also become ceremonial. And this is a head pot uh, that was found down around the Missouri boot heel. In fact, I think it was found actually in Arkansas, but these kind of head, uh, head pots were very prominent down in that part of, of Missouri uh, with the late Mississippian culture. So there again, you see not only the, the pot itself becoming refined over a couple thousand years, but you also see uh, its use being refined. I think that the pipe is a, a really amazing uh, innovation for indigenous people because it was not simply a smoking uh, tool, but it became something that was sacred, ceremonial, and it also became something that was the center of uh, diplomatic meetings. So here you see um, on the left side a photograph, and if you look closely, you can see that the two men in the middle, the man smoking the pipe and the man on his left, his right is uh, our white man. And so this shows how uh, if you were an indigenous person and you wanted to adopt someone into your family, you wanted to uh, form a trade alliance, maybe a military alliance with uh, white people or people from another tribe, you know, you wanted to enlarge your kinship breach, uh, the pipe was the center of that. We sometimes hear them called peace pipes for that reason and that they would be smoked at peace treaties which is true, but I think more correctly, they're called sacred pipes. Um, the, they say that the first pipes, uh, I've been told that the very first pipes were probably made out of bone. Maybe they were made out of wood. This particular pipe, you see that kind of uh, uh, maroon colored stone inlaid with uh, silver, maybe? It's hard to tell, but that is called Catlinite. It's named after George Catlin, the American artist. Uh, pipestone is also what it's called, and some of you may know about Pipestone, Minnesota, where uh, that pipe, uh, that kind of stone, it's one of the only places in the world where that stone is mined. And so that's what a lot of the pipes, even today, a lot of pipes are made out of that catlinite because it's uh, really, really easy to work with. You know, it molds nice, it sands down beautifully, you can make a really beautiful pipe out of it. Um, so the use of the pipe, not only was it, it, was it used to 
um, as I said, for ceremonies and kinship and things like that. But um, as things got more uh, dicey, you know, as white people moved into the United States and things got, it created a lot of chaos. You know, the introduction of white people moving West, um, you know, it sent a lot of tribes into a period of real uncertainty. And as that period of uncertainty increased, the, the pipe became more and more popular. Uh, the pipe became religiously significant. Every sort of sacred ceremony, the pipe would be used. Uh, when Marquette and Joliet visited Peoria in Northeast Missouri, they were welcomed with an elaborate ceremony. And the pipe was a, was a, uh, a center point of that ceremony. Um, and in fact, I think Marquette and Joliet were both given pipes. Later, when LaSalle came traveled to missouri down the mississippi river he carried a pipe he would stand on the canoe and carry a pipe so that people seeing him on the shore would know that because he had a pipe he was not coming um to make war he was coming to make friends and then the last thing the last p is powwows um Powwows are uh, something that still go on today. We have a, I'm involved in an organization that uh, has a powwow in Jefferson City, Missouri, every Memorial Day weekend. And um, powwow is, a, it's a, not really a religious ceremony so much. It's more like a, a social event. And it was, it's something that's been going on for over a hundred years now. And the powwow was a response to changing life for American Indians. You see again here, this is another map of, uh, of, of uh, reservations west of Missouri. And actually this one is from 1846. The one I showed you earlier is what those reservations look like now. But as the people were, uh, right after the people were moved out of Missouri, this was more the, uh, the lay of the land as it was. So people were confined onto reservations and with that came more government control. Every tribe had a, a, an American Indian agent assigned to them. And a lot of uh, ceremonies, once those people were confined to their reservations, the American agents were able to really crack down on indigenous ceremonies. Uh, so indigenous people were really uh, prohibited from practicing their, their religions and their ceremonies for a long, long time. Um, but what was okay even though they couldn't have their, their ceremonies, they were able to dance um, and do ex exhibition dancing. And uh, some of you may have heard of uh, things like uh, Wild uh, Bill's, uh, Wild Bill's uh, show, his Indian show, uh, Buffalo Bill, Buffalo Bill Cody's Indian show. And those were exhibitions of indigenous people riding horses, doing mock battles and dancing. And so um, that was okay, as long as it was under white control and, you know, it was done for entertainment, they were allowed to do that. And over time, then, those kind of exhi exhibition dances that were really made to uh, a piece to white people, you know, cater to white and European tastes, uh, indigenous people took those over for themselves, and the powwows became something that they... Uh, made their own. Powwows were also uh, a response to tribal termination policies. What you had, oh, starting in the late 19, uh, uh, in the late, late 1800s, up until, you know, the 1950s was the federal government trying to terminate uh, indigenous tribal governments. They tried to break up the tribes, um, they tried to, you know, get them to assimilate um, and tried to make indigenous people less bound to their traditional tribal structure and more bound to um, what would be called, I guess, uh, American society, uh, white American society. Well, powwows, again, brought people together as the government forced indigenous people to become less associated with their tribes, um, they 
would reach out to other indigenous people and you get what's called kind of a pan Indian movement where people powwows could bring together people of various tribes, um, you know, and, and even though they may have different histories, different languages, they all shared the, the commonality of, of being indigenous. <clears throat> and when this really took off was when indigenous people were uh, moved to cities. Uh, generally, it happened um, after World War II. So you might not know this, but after World War II, there was a program called the Voluntary Relocation Program. And um, the United States government tried to get indigenous people to move into cities, away from their reservations, into cities um, to, you know, get factory jobs, to help work with the war effort, you know, or automobile factories or manufacturing or whatever. Um, St. Louis was one of the cities where the government resettled indigenous people. And these are some uh, newspaper articles from that. Thousands of people were resettled into Missouri, into St. Louis, uh, I think from eight, 1956 to 1960, maybe. Uh, very few of them stayed. What One of the problems was is that they wouldn't let indigenous people settle in one neighborhood where they'd be able to support each other. They forced the indigenous uh, immigrants to settle in different parts of the city. And because out of that displacement and, you know, that culture shock, you get the um, establishment of what are known as Indian centers. Um, there's a very active Indian center right now in Springfield, Missouri, and a very active Indian center in Kansas City, Missouri. And there again, you have people from different tribes coming together, um, and their bond is the fact that they're all away from home, but they all have this commonality of being indigenous. And there again, the powwow helped with that. And in just the last few minutes here, I'll show you some pictures of our powwow, um, just to show you, you know, that that this lives on in the, in the uh, 21st century. The center of every powwow is a drum, and down in the lower left-hand side, you'll see Kevin Leroy from Oklahoma and his drum. <clears throat> and they're at the very center of the circle, and then around that circle, uh, you'll see people dancing. Uh, here we've got people in regalia. You get a chance to, and it's not, you know, it, sometimes people don't know what to call the outfits that indigenous people wear in Palo, but they're called regalia. And then also I put in this picture of the flag. Uh, uh, every, despite everything that indigenous people have gone through, they are very patriotic and have one of the highest rates of um, service in the armed forces of any ethnic group in America. So it's just a way for indigenous people to get together to express their culture. Here you have uh, culinary and artistic traditions. A lot of vendors will come and they'll sell things that they've made over the years. Uh, here's uh, Corey Bad Horse from the Indian Center on the upper left-hand side making fry bread. Don't go to a powwow and not, not eat the fry bread. It's excellent. And then you see again on the far right-hand side, just some of the artistry that goes into the regalia. And it's about family. Here you see kids of all ages uh, participating in powwow. And on the upper left-hand side, this again is a picture of Cody. Um, uh, and uh, Cody Goff from Jamestown, Missouri. And at our powwow last year, his son, Ezekiel, I think, was 10 days old. And so as a way of passing on or introducing his new son, brand new son, to the tradition of powwow, he brought him into the circle and danced a little bit with him. But here you see kids of all ages. It's This is, um, you know, it's a learning experience. It's a family experience. And that's how the culture gets, um, how it gets passed on. My final part here is, uh, I guess this kind of goes back to talking a little bit about uh, why I don't necessarily do um, land acknowledgements. I think that really what's important at this point in time is to offer indigenous people a chance to uh, come back to their traditional homeland and interact in some way some meaningful way with that land. Um, and I've got a couple of examples here of recent projects where that's been done. Um, 
This is a rest stop, a highway rest stop on Interstate 29 outside of Glenwood, Iowa. And it is uh, decorated inside and out with um, indigenous themed art. And so what the Iowa Department of Transportation did is they invited um, people whose ancestors once lived in Iowa to come in uh, and, and uh, create artwork specifically for that rest stop. Um, I think it's really beautiful. Some of my favorite stuff here is in the middle of the two bathroom signs with the ribbon work on the bathroom. But here you see we have uh, Iowa's, Osage's, Pawnee's, Oda, Missouri's. Um, check it out if you're on your way to Sioux City or Omaha or something next time. And here's a similar project where indigenous people in Lawrence, Kansas were invited to decorate uh, and design bus stops. And of course, Lawrence, uh, because of it, it's uh, it has Haskell Nations University. It's the home of Haskell Nations University, and it's also uh, adjacent to some uh, some reservations. So it has actually quite a high indigenous population. And then here it's at the University of Missouri, you see Yakita Starfield's mural that hangs in the student center. He is Osage, Cherokee, and uh, Muskogee. And so all of these are just, I mean, it's a simple thing. They're all examples of people uh, being allowed to come back express themselves, you know, interact with their former homelands in a certain way. And then this is a project, uh, I mentioned this at the very beginning, um, you know, and this is an important project that is ongoing and it, it allowed the people of the Ka Nation to come and reclaim one of their monuments. Uh, on the right-hand picture, is a rock that up until very recently, I guess about a year or two ago, was in the um, in Robinson Park in Lawrence, Kansas. It was a it was a stone that was sacred to the Kansas people, but the city the city founders of Lawrence, Kansas, took it and they put it in a park, Robinson Park, which I think is named after a former. Kansas governor, and you'll see a big metal plaque on there, and that is the names of uh, Lawrence, Kansas's founder, and I believe it was called the Founder Monument or the Founder Stone. Um, after years and years of negotiations, um, it was finally, the people of Lawrence finally allowed the Kansas people to come back and take the stone, and in the uh, bottom left-hand side, uh, you see just earlier this month, April 2nd, the stone was taken back to Council Grove, Kansas, where the, where the cause owned property, uh, some of their sacred land, and they returned it to, 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 the, to the nation so that they can once again uh, celebrate what for them has been sacred for, for many, many centuries. So that's a, a really successful example of sort of allowing people to come back and and, and uh, giving them some opportunity to take back what was theirs. Here's another quick example. This is um, up in the upper left-hand side is a Indian mound from the, it's a Mississippian mound and it's in St. Louis. It was part of the Cahokia complex, which is a picture of Cahokia down below there on the left-hand side. Um, the Osages bought the mound. It's the last uh, existing mound in St. Louis, Missouri. And the Osages bought it in 2009. And uh, they tore down this house that you see on the right-hand side of the picture. And they're going to preserve it. Uh, the Osages claim to have been uh, an important part of the people who built the mounds in Cahokia. So you see on the right-hand side in the bottom, uh, so, uh, their uh, poster that says, before they built the arch, we built the mounds. And in closing, I just showed this slide. This is a piece of art by Nicholas Galanin, modeled after the famous Hollywood sign in Los Angeles. This is in Southern California, Southeast of Los Angeles. But wherever you are, you are on Indian land. And Beth, that is all I have to say. That's the end of my talk. Well, all right. Well, that was just wonderful, Greg. Um, but one of the things that, uh, Greg, I did want to ask you about is for so long you have been, uh, you've put your heart and soul into studying indigenous cultures here in the 
in the Midwest, in Missouri, Iowa. Um, what led you as a basically a white man from uh, from uh -huh. Iowa to have the interest? And then once you did learn <laughs> about it, uh, being able to gain that trust with these different cultures. I think, yeah, I think that my initial interest came from the fact that I'm always, I grew up on a farm in Northwest Iowa. And so I've always been really interested in place and history of places, uh, local history. So every place I've lived in my life, my, the way I get to know it is through local history. And of course, everywhere you live in North America, you live on, like the slide says, Indian land. And um, um, so doing local history, it was, I noticed that it was a part of local history that was often missing. Um, even here in Colombia, you know, we don't really, it, 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 when we celebrated our bicentennial, it was a part that was not largely talked about. So that's kind of what was my initial interest. And then over the years, it, it was hard. You know, I, I had to um, just basically cold, cold call. I started working with the Iowa Nation because as a native of Iowa, I was embarrassed to admit that I, I was probably in my 30s before I ever found out that there was an Iowa Nation. And and so um, they were the people that I first approached and uh, just over a long period of time, getting to know one person and another person and having some people uh, to talk to about history. I guess I've been working with them for over 20 years now. And that's the thing. It just it takes a long time. You know, you have to invest time in getting to know people and working with them and listening to their side of the history of history. So, and I may need to have you look at this question. Um, it's from Glenn who asked, how do you pronounce, and I'm not going to pronounce it, <laughs> right? He has different names in there. Oh, you go yeah. To, do you see that? Yeah, I see it. Yeah. Um, okay. Nitachi, Dehega, and Chiwere, uh, Nokanshka, I guess is the first one. Uh when do you think the Little Osages moved near the Nitachi? So that the uh, Nitachi, and I'm I'm <laughs> I'm I'm butchering these names as well, but that was the name that the uh, Missouri has called themselves. Um, and so, um, gosh, you know, uh, he, and he wants to know when did they come move near each other? Some people might say that actually that goes back a long time into the woodland because. Um, while there were Osages who were part of the of the Cahokia complex, I think that there were some Osages as well that were part of what was called the Oneota, and they were people who lived here in central Missouri, and they were made up of the Iowa, the, o, the Iowa, the Odo, Missouri, and and as they say, perhaps the the um, Osages as well. So I would say maybe that goes on back into um, you know woodland times over a thousand years ago because I think they may have been you know allies and friends back then the right. the, the tribal names we know now are our names that came up after white contact and so people had different alliances and different names before them that makes sense <laughs> um so Emily writes uh, she works for them as first Missouri State Capitol in St Charles. And they were wondering if around our time period, 1820, if there was much of an indigenous presence in St. Louis surrounding area, uh, which as we know, our city's founder married an Osage woman, and that was common among French fur traders. But how common would it have been to see indigenous people in around Missouri in the 1820s? Um, I think that there definitely before the 1820s, I mean, indigenous people, when St. Louis was first founded, indigenous people were very common. Um, very common in, in um, St. Louis because even before the French moved there, it was a place where indigenous people would often meet. Um, so I would say that um, up until probably, yeah, the 1830s, I would say, and in fact, there, there are some paintings of indigenous people and, and I'm going to I'm going to blank out on the name of the woman who painted them. But I think that they were definitely a common sight. Um, before the state of Missouri, um, before the state of Missouri was founded, after the state was founded, maybe a little bit less so. So as far as 1820, yeah, I would say still there would be indigenous people 
coming to do business. You know, St. Louis was a really multicultural uh, settlement. Sure. And kind of backing that up a little bit, once you did have uh, European settlers coming into to Missouri, um, can you kind of give us a picture of what Missouri was like then when the first European settlers came and that first interaction with Native Americans? Well, I think that the very first interactions, uh, the indigenous people, most people who lived in Missouri knew about white people, even though they'd never been to Missouri, white people. Because, uh, you know, when uh, Marquette and Joliet came and they met the Peorias, they found European trade goods in the village, even though when Europeans had never been in the village, the Peorias had been trading with them for decades in from the Great Lakes. They'd been traveling to the Great Lakes, or they'd been buying trade goods from other tribes that had been to the Great Lakes. So I think the most earliest uh, encounters were about trade. Um, natives wanted the trade, wanted those goods, you know, that the Europeans had. They wanted the guns. They wanted the weapons. They wanted, you know, the cloth and things like that. And then in return, the Europeans wanted the furs. So I think the earliest interactions were more economic. And of course, I guess also uh, we can't forget that Father Marquette was part of that too. And so they were also trying to convert uh, natives to Christianity. Uh, Glenn asked, when did the Osage and the Missouri acquire horses? Um, I have read that it was probably around 1700, the year 1700. Um, there is a contingent of indigenous people who will claim that there were always horses here. And if you know the story of horses, you know that uh, what we've been taught is that in, in ancient times, there were small horses that were indigenous to this continent and that they died off. And then it was the Spanish who introduced horses to North America through Mexico. So, and, that, and that's why we, even today, we have all these wild horse herds in the Southwest. They were, they're descendants of that. Um, but they made their way up. Uh, and what, from what I understand about the year 1700 is when um, they started, you know, they, is when they, they were widely available to Osages in Missouri. And uh, so, Greg, we do have um, the powwow coming up uh, over Memorial Day weekend. Do you want to talk a little bit about it and uh, that it is everybody is welcome to join right. in on it and where it's going to happen? And Sure. Yeah. And uh, again, thanks to the SHS for being a, a sponsor and help, helping sponsor the powwow. It's something that we do every Memorial Day weekend. It's in Jefferson City. Uh, I get questions a lot, emails from people wanting to know, is it okay for a non-Indigenous person to go? And it is definitely okay for non-Indigenous people. We have in our program, we'll have some, you know, simple rules of etiquette that you need to follow. But for the most part, I mean, it's a family event. It's free this year. You can come. It's at the JC Fairgrounds in Jefferson City. Uh, it's on the 25th and the 26th, which is the Saturday and the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend. We start things off about noon and uh, just come and enjoy. There'll be vendors, there'll be food, and there'll be a lot of dancing and a lot of a lot of uh, spectacular regalia and singing as well, too. And any resources that people can learn more about uh, Missouri's indigenous peoples? I know your book is for sure one of them. I was going to say, I... I'd have to, yeah, I'd have to say that that my book is a good place. Um, you know, I think that uh, there, you know, I would go to the uh, museum. There's a really nice little museum at the Van Meter State Park, and that is sort of the Missouri State Park System's uh, indigenous museum. I'd say that's a good place to start. Uh, Mike Dickey has written a really great book about the, the Missourias. And I know there's there are several really good books about the Osages. And, you know, also today, most of the tribes on their own websites have a history page. So, you know, you look up Osages, they've got all kinds of information on their pages. Sack and Fox, same thing. So, yeah, even that that's probably the easiest place to start. Sure. And the Trail of Tears uh, State Park, another one of exactly. the uh, state park. Yeah, down in Cape right. Toronto, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, yeah, anyway, definitely worth traveling. 
Sure, for sure. Well, thank you so much, Greg, for joining us and being part of this. And thank you all for being here. We hope you have a great day.